Ypres, a market town in Flanders. A beleaguered fortress guarding the last free corner of Belgian soil. Ypres to the British army, or Ypres. Wipers to the newspapers and the upper classes. The British first came to Ypres in October 1914. We pass over the moat through Vauban's 17th century ramparts by the Lille Gate. The large cobbled square is full of British and Belgian troops. We pay a too brief visit to the wonderful Flemish Cloth Hall and St. Martin's Church. It's a gem of a town, with its lovely old world gabled houses, red tiled roofs, and no factories visible to spoil the charm. The first battle of Ypres in 1914 began to demolish the charm. Hey, In 1915, still heavier bombardments beat upon the ancient town. This was the second battle. Ypres crumbled steadily, but held out. Through it lay all communication to the salient. The salient was a vast British slaughterhouse. Everywhere the Germans looked down on the British positions from the so-called ridges. It was in the salient in April 1915 that the Germans first used the new weapon of gas. I demand admitting that uh... I didn't think much of the urinating on the on handkerchief. I didn't think it was sufficient protection. So I went into one of the trench latrines, uh, you know, just a bucket stuck in a hole, and I stuck my head in the bucket. I made sure of it. And in the salient at Hooge, two months later, the British first encountered the horror of flamethrowers. The first idea that sort of flitted through my mind was that the end of the world had come, and this was the day of judgment. Because suddenly the whole dawn had turned ghastly crimson. In April, Vimy. In June, Messi. The two strongest bastions of the German front had been stormed by the British army. All the omens seemed favorable for the great offensive. Breaking out of the salient seemed to be only a matter of time and preparation. The army trained and labored at the massive build-up required for a set-piece battle in 1917. They were in good heart. They did not know that ugly clouds were gathering about their enterprise. On June the 19th, Haig was summoned to London to discuss the campaign with the cabinet. The meetings were charged with ill feeling Distrust between the nation's political leaders and its generals had never been higher. When Sir Douglas Haig explained his projects to the civilians, he spread on the table a large map and made dramatic use of both his hands to demonstrate how he proposed to sweep up the enemy. First the right hand brushed along the surface irresistibly, then came the left, the outer finger ultimately touching the German frontier with a nail across. It is not surprising that some of our number were so captivated by the splendour of the landscape opened out to our vision that their critical faculties were overwhelmed. Lloyd George remained sceptical, but there was a shock in store for him. A most serious and startling situation was disclosed today. At today's conference, Admiral Jellicoe, as First Sea Lord, stated that owing to the great shortage of shipping due to the German submarines, it would be impossible for Great Britain to continue the war in 1918. This was a bombshell for the cabinet and all present. 
Jellico insisted that Zeebrugge must be cleared of U-boats. Lloyd George was in a dilemma. It was decided that I should once more sum up the misgivings which most of us felt and that the responsibility for decisions should be left until yesterday's gear and stores. Halted against the shade of a last hill, they fed and lying easy were at ease and finding comfortable chests and knees carelessly slept. But many there stood still to face the stark blank sky beyond the ridge knowing their feet had come to the end of the world. Final decisions, final preparations. I've ordered the provost sergeant with the battalion police to line up in the front trench as soon as the assault starts. They are to arrest any men who return improperly. Although I command a battalion whose courage and loyalty have never given me a trace of anxiety, one must guard against those inexplicable panics which may seize brave men and which are so infectious. This, by now, was an army of veterans. The men of 1917 were warier, more skillful, but they were less hasty to sacrifice themselves. The war itself was an older and uglier beast. Edmund Blunden wrote, There were opportunities enough for death or glory but the experienced sense observed that people did not espouse them with the comparatively bright eye of a year before. 1917 was distasteful. Zero hour was 3.50 a.m. on July the 31st. Nine divisions of the 5th Army, five divisions of the 2nd Army, and two French divisions went over the top. This was the British Army's largest single effort since the Somme, 13 months before. Even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. Gas, gas, quick boys. An ecstasy of fumbling fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or life. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. The barrage roars and lifts, then clumsily bowed with bombs and guns and shovels and battle gear. Men jostle and climb to meet the bristling fire. Lines of grey, muttering faces, masked with fear, they leave their trenches, going over the top while time ticks blank and busy on their wrists, and hope with furtive eyes and grappling fists, floundered. At the same moment as us, we pressed on and reached our objective. We were on sloping ground, and ahead lay the crest of a ridge. The Australians were standing on the very edge of the salient. General Monash, commanding their third division, wrote, Great happenings are possible in the very near future, as the enemy is terribly disorganized. Our success was complete and unqualified. We got absolutely astride of the main ridge. The Germans called October the 4th a black day. Ludendorff wrote, The infantry battle commenced on the morning of the 4th. It was extraordinarily severe. And again, we only came through with enormous losses. Now the great question presented itself in simple terms. In view of three step-by-step -step blows, all successful, what will be stinking ponds? British, Australian and New Zealand soldiers crept towards Passchendaele. I don't know how far the duck boards extended because it was such slow going up to the front. It must have been hundreds and hundreds of yards and they zigzagged about. But each side was a sea of mud. You stumbled and slid along. If you slipped, you went up to, to the waist, possibly. Not only that, but even in every pool, you'd fall in the decomposed bodies of humans, and mules, or mules, and perhaps both. 
And if you're wounded and slipped off, well, then that was the end of it. I died in hell. They called it Passchendaele. My wound was slight, and I was hobbling back. And then a shell burst slick upon the duckboards. So I fell into the bottomless mud and lost the light. How many men, wounded, overburdened, or overtired, vanished in the swamp? No one will know. The October days were nightmares for the British Army. The icy fingers of nightmare clutched men's hearts on both sides of the line. The only thought in it was that the Germans were in as bad a position as we were. In fact, we had a case where one little party of men was making, trying to make their uh, hole more comfortable, scooping it out, and some hundreds of yards away, the Germans were doing the same, but both in their miseries and taking a damn notice of each other. A German officer wrote, I am scared. For the first time in this war, I have doubts whether we shall be able to hold out against the odds. <laughs> The place was rotten with dead. Green, clumsy legs, high-booted, sprawled and groveled along the saps, and trunks, face downward in the sucking mud, wallowed like trodden sandbags loosely filled. And naked, sodden buttocks, mats of hair, bulged, clotted heads slept in the plastering slime, and then the rain began, the jolly old rain. Who are these? Why sit they here in twilight? The war. And another German wrote in his last letter home, You do not know what Flanders means. Flanders means endless human endurance. Flanders means blood and scraps of human bodies. Flanders means heroic courage and faithfulness, even unto death. In the Ypres salient, the ultimate battle was fought, not amid the swamps, but in the hearts of men. And now they were beginning to recognize their other enemy. A war correspondent caught a hint of it. For the first time, the British Army lost its spirit of optimism, and there was a sense of deadly depression among many officers and men with whom I came in. But the issue was no one, no infantryman at all, minded one bit being shot about or doing his job on a terra firma somewhere where he could stand to fight. But here we, we were so hopelessly placed that uh, there was no thought whatsoever of getting to any final objective because you couldn't even swim or stagger there. So there was this bitter feeling that, that did prevail among quite a lot of our infantrymen uh, when they saw their lads and they knew, not wounded and not killed, but drowned in this filthy mud. I can see them. Since we believe not otherwise can kind fires burn, nor ever sun smile true on child or field or fruit. For God's invincible spring, our love is made afraid. Therefore not loath we lie out here. Therefore we're born. For love of God seems dying. Goodbye, old lad. Remember me to God, and tell him that our politicians swear they won't give in till Prussian rule's been trod under the heel of England. Are you there? Yes. 
and the war won't end for at least two years. But we've got stacks of men. I'm blind with tears, staring into the... I wish they'd killed you in a decent show. Thank you.